Well, everything has to have a beginning. That's right. And the BCO has a beginning. And that's, first of all, saying the Book of Church Order. And uh, it has a preface. And then there are certain things called the preliminary principles. That's right. And the beginning is not just at the front of the book. Yeah. The beginning is really the part out of which everything else flows. Right. So the preliminary principles are really uh, quite old in the history of Presbyterianism in America. Uh, they actually were written as the preliminary principles for the original Book of Church Order that was developed by the uh, first General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in 1787, 1788, and finally approved in 1789. That's right. Most people don't realize that our Book of Church Order didn't just spring full-grown in 1973. No, it really was founded upon previous Books of Church Order, which is a good thing because that you learn how to govern the church over the course of time. Yeah, so why is it called preliminary principles? Because these are the principles upon which all of uh, the rules and the regulations hang. There's a reason why we have certain provisions in the Book of Church Order, and it is to uh, put forward these principles, important biblical principles that guide church government. Now, I remember in uh, listening quite a few times to lectures from uh, Jack Williamson, and also Bob Canada, who were very instrumental in putting together the PCA's version of the Book of Church Order and how they focused uh, so much on the preliminary principles as being the lens through which you look at all the other provisions of the Book of Church Order. That's right. I think no preliminary principle is more important than the first one, and that's that God alone is Lord of the conscience. And why is that? What's the conscience do? Where, why does that fit into a Book of Church Order? Well, this sets forth the idea that the church holds ecclesiastical power, not the power of the state. It has the power of God's Word, not the power of the sword. And so you can't compel someone to believe something. You simply have to teach them the truth, and their conscience can't be bound. It can't be bound by elders or a church court or a document. It has to be bound by the Lord Himself. So in other words, as we're reading through the provisions of the Book of Church Order, we keep in mind that this is what we believe regulates the life of the church, gives order to it, so that everyone's on the same page, so to speak, with reference to what we're doing, but we're not going to bind you if you don't feel like you can keep them. That's right, and that's why the BCO has provisions in it that deal with difficulties, challenges, and conflict, because it's not cookie cutter for everyone. We can't compel everyone to believe exactly the same thing at exactly the same time in exactly the same way. Okay, and so the, the first issue then is the conscience, and the conscience is based on the principles that we find in Scripture. So the Word of God then becomes very important in this process too. That's right, but God alone, the Lord of the conscience, doesn't mean that the church is a free-for-all, because there's another equally important preliminary principle that says that the church can set its parameters for admission. In other words, uh, that the history of uh, creeds, confessions, and book of order basically do two things. They include and they exclude. They include those who say, this is what I can adopt and I can accept and I can live with. They exclude someone who says, no, I can't go by those principles and follow those particular uh, uh, provisions uh, that is, regulates the church. Right. And what we see here is that the church is a voluntary organization. And this is not just true of the denomination. This is true of the local church. You can't compel someone to join your church or to stay as a member of your church. If their conscience leads them to different beliefs than the, that what the church professes, then they can join with another Christian communion. And we in the PCA don't believe that we are the only true church. We believe that there are other expressions of the church, the true church, throughout America and the world throughout history. And that's where the inclusion-exclusion comes in, because if you're dealing with a Baptist church or a Methodist church or Episcopalian, they have their own order, and uh, they, some of those things would exclude us if we believe what the uh, Presbyterian system is. That's right. And so this actually frees up the Presbyterian church in America and its presbyteries and its local churches to confess what it believes. Um, in our Westminster Confession of Faith and in the larger and shorter catechisms. And so we can confess what the Bible teaches and what the truth is so that our members can live in accordance with the truth. Uh, I think I saw on there the preliminary principles also cover the things about it's something called ministerial and declarative. 
Yes, this is an important principle. What it means is the authority of church elders is to declare God's truth. I can speak, I must speak what God gives me in His Word, but I must not speak to things that are not in God's Word. I can't bind people's consciences. I can't declare truth for all time that God hasn't given to us in His Word. Okay, and that means, okay, and they also make a distinction between the spiritual nature of the church versus the civil nature of the, uh, uh, the magistrate, the uh, government. That's right. The church doesn't have the power of the sword. It can't tax people. It can't put people in prison. It can't harm people. All of these things are in the power of the state. The church merely declares the truth, and it shouldn't shrink back from declaring the truth. We can be bold in declaring the truth. We can challenge people with the truth, but we have to realize that there is a stark division between the power of the church and the power of the state. Okay, and that, now that gives us an important point to make, uh, that the, when we are making um, de de direct declarative uh, statements, that we need, they ne need to be seen not as compulsion, okay, because we're dealing with the conscience, but it is ministerial in saying that we really believe this is important for the life of the church, and we trust that you will understand that as you become a part of this particular branch of the, of the universal church. And what we're saying there is that we trust the Lord, and particularly the Holy Spirit, to take His Word as we declare His Word to change lives, to bring forward the gospel, and to see the church storm the gates of hell. We don't need to rely upon the powers of the state and um, ordinary persuasion. We have the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Right. Now, the other thing that comes out then, if being Presbyterian, is that we believe very strongly that uh, the, the members of the church are the ones who actually choose the, those who will give leadership to them. That's right. No leader can be foisted upon a congregation. This is a principle that goes all the way back to the Reformation. And the people of the congregation nominate, elect, and install, choose their leaders, deacons, elders, and pastors. Which is a very important point of pre Presbyterianism itself is. I know some people ask questions about what is Presbyterianism versus uh, a, a con congregational system uh, or a bishopric system That's right. of, of uh, government. Yes. The congregation cannot cede this power away. It must take this seriously. And much of our polity is built on it, as we'll see as we talk about discipline and other matters. Okay, so uh, where does it come, where does it, uh, that part end? I think the last principle is that the truth of these uh, principles are such that they, are, they come from God, they lead the church, they give uh, true guidance to us so that we're not uh, bound up and it's not compulsion. Uh, and it is, and it's almost, I think it says almost self-evident, this is what God wants us to do. That's right, that's right. And so, again, if I can repeat myself, we as leaders in the church are to speak what God has given to us in His Word. We don't give the commandments of men. That's clear from the Scripture. And so the way that that works itself out in the governing of the church is through this preliminary principle reminding us of the biblical truth that from the prophets of the Old Testament to the apostles of the New Testament that the, the purpose of the leaders of the church is to declare to the church what Jesus has committed to them. All right. The summary would be the church is spiritual. Uh, it makes declarations. It doesn't compel. That's right. Uh, it's ministerial. That's right. That means it serves and it's moral because we are, it's based on God's truth and His commandments. And all of this is founded in the Bible. It's not because you or I think that's a wise way to do things, or even men 100 or 200 years ago before us thought it was. These principles are derived from the Scriptures, which are eternal and the very Word of God. Well, that's good preliminary principles, the lens through which we look at everything else that we'll have in this series.